jump right in. Chicago is considered to be one of the most beautiful skylines in the world. I personally think it's the most beautiful, but it is inarguably within the top 10. And that was made possible by a tragedy. On October 8th, 1871, the city of Chicago caught on fire. At the time of the fire, the population of Chicago was 300,000. During the two days of the fire, one third of the city burned to the ground. What that means, 17,000 homes and businesses were destroyed, leaving 100,000 people homeless, and 250 people died. It was a tragedy by any stretch of the imagination. It was also an opportunity, because it gave us a second chance to build a second city. And that is why we are called the Second City. Not because we're second to New York. As they would have you believe, but because we're literally built a second city on the ashes and debris of the first city. A little bit more history. You go across that bridge, that is the approximate location of Fort Dearborn. In 1803, the federal government built us a fort. In 1812, it was destroyed in the fire during the War of 1812. That's correct. Now across the river, at street level, we have the London Guarantee and Accident Building, completed in 1923. The architect is Alfred Allschuler, and it's in a style that we call Beaux Arts. And Beaux Arts is defined by having a decorative base, stack of floors, decorative top. Now, it's now called the London House Hotel, which is a boutique hotel that got its name from a jazz club that used to be in there called the London House is correct. Now you got on the boat at the base of the Wrigley Building. We're gonna talk about that later in the tour. I wanna talk about this building across the street, the Neo-Gothic Tower called the Tribune Tower, completed in 1925. The architects are Hood and Howells, and it's inspired by European cathedrals. You look up, there are flying buttresses. In European cathedrals, flying buttresses are load-bearing. Tribune Tower, nearly over my toe. Now the Tribune Company moved out and the building is going condo. I was thinking about it for a little bit, but then my commute would be too short. And I used my commute to improve on my tour. Oh, and they range from 700,000 to 8 mil. Now we're gonna turn the boat around and we are gonna head out towards the Chicago Harbor Lock. We're gonna go through the Chicago Harbor Lock out onto Lake Michigan. Then we'll come back and go down the main branch of the Chicago River. While we are on the river, most of the tour takes place on the right-hand side of the boat in the direction of travel. I'll let you know when that's not the case. Now, once we get on the other side of the bridge, you're going to see a red brick building. South of that, this way is south, is a white building with black vertical windows. It's called the Aon Center. It's also been called the Standard Oil Building and the Amico Building. And it was originally clad in Italian Carrera marble which is some of the most expensive marble in the world. It's what Michelangelo used. So to cut down on building costs, they turned it too thin, and it didn't hold up well during Chicago windows. They eventually took all the marble off and reclad the building in North Carolina granite. Cost them about $80 million, which just goes to show you can't take marble for granted. I don't tell that one very often, but I'm feeling bolder. I take some stones. Okay, we've got this blue green glass building with the white undulating balconies. Aqua, completed in 2009, it's an award-winning residential building. The architect is Studio Gang, the lead architect is Genie Gang. And until 2020, it was the tallest building in the world with a female architect as a lead architect. You might be wondering what replaced it, we'll get there later. But I gotta tell you about this body of water we're on called the Chicago River. We're gonna be going through the Chicago Harbor Lock. I'm going to spend the next few minutes setting up the who, what, when, where, why, how of the Chicago Harbor Lock. You're going to want to pay attention because it is predictable that if you don't, you'll be very confused in the foreseeable future. Now, we are on the Chicago River at its deepest point. It is 35 feet deep and it used to flow into Lake Michigan, which was and is our source of drinking water here in Chicago. And in the 1800s, we treated this river like a toilet. We used it to discard all of our industrial, animal, and human ways. You can Google pictures of chickens walking across the Chicago River. In 1885, we had a torrential rainstorm with very strong winds coming out of the west. And the concern was the river water was gonna get blown 
two miles off the shores of Lake Michigan into our drinking water. Luckily, that didn't happen. We had to do something about our water, though. So we formed the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. If you're not from Chicago, you might be going to hear a really inspiring story on how we were pioneers in cleaning up our water. No, I'm going to tell you how we made our problem someone else's problem. Between the South Branch of the Chicago River and the Displains River, there's a portage. We dug a canal 35 feet deep, because gravity says water goes to the deepest point. We named it the Sanitation and Ship with a pea canal. And on January 2nd, 1900, we opened the canal and we reversed the flow of the Chicago River. So now it flows down the South Branch, down the canal, down the Displains River, down the Illinois River, down the Mississippi River, all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. We could take this boat to New Orleans if we wanted to. We're not going to, but we could. Now, I digress, we got sued a couple times. First by St. Louis, because their source of drinking water was and is the Mississippi River. Unfortunately for them, the trial was held in Chicago and they lost. Don't worry, they got even with us, they bottled up that gross, disgusting river water and sold it back to us in the form of Budweiser. <laughs> we then got sued by Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin. They were concerned that we were going to uh, drain Lake Michigan. We lost that lawsuit. So the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District built the Chicago Harbor Lock. Now the lock was built for one reason, to prevent Lake Michigan water from coming into the Chicago River. Because of the lock, Lake Michigan is now a few feet higher than the Chicago River. So every time the lock opens, about 800,000 gallons of Lake Michigan water comes into the Chicago River. This is how it's gonna work. The Riverside gates are open. We're gonna drive in, the Riverside gates will close behind us, the Lake Michigan side gates will open just to crack and start filling the lock chamber with water. Now, a good way to think of the lock chamber is think of it as a giant bathtub, and the boat is the world's largest rubber ducky. So as it fills with water, it's gonna lift up the boat. Once the boat is level with Lake Michigan, it's will open wide and go out of the Lake Michigan. Pause on the lock for just a moment. We've got this black building with the curving glass curtain wall, Lake Point Tower condominiums, completed in 1968. The architects are Shipperite and Heinrich. Now, there's a rumor that Oprah Winfrey lived in this building. Oprah never, ever lived there. She might have started the rumor herself because she lived at Water Tower Place, and she just didn't want people to know where she lived. If you look out, there's a disc-shaped portion of the building. That is a French restaurant called the Cité. It does not rotate, but you get great views of the Cité. Now, across the street is Navy Pier, built in 1916. It was originally called Municipal Pier Number 2. It never was a number one. They were going to build that later on the south side. And we decided we didn't want any commercial boating. And they moved everything and renamed it Navy Pier after World War I to honor our veterans. World War II, we did our part. It was a naval training facility. Then it was University of Illinois at Navy Pier. Then it was empty for about 30 years. In 1995, they completed a $255 million renovation. Now, there's a lot to do. We've got the Ferris wheel. The gondolas are enclosed in climate control. There's a Tony Award winning Shakespeare Theater. Lots of places to eat and drink at various points. St. Regis of Chicago. It was completed in 2020. 
The architect is Studio Gang, the lead architect is Genie Gang. And that is the tallest building in the world with a female architect as a lead architect. It is also, yeah, yeah, also overall, the third tallest building in the city of Chicago. So if you look up near the top, which you can't really see because the sun is glaring, but there, it looks like it's not quite finished. It didn't pass the, now we can see it. I made that happen. Now, it looks like it's not quite finished. It didn't pass the wind shearing test. So that's called the blow through floor. It allows the wind to blow through like a vent. Now, on the left hand side, you've got this broken fountain. It's called Centennial Fountain. Built to celebrate 100 years of the formation of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. In the seawall, there's a pyramid with a spigot. Every hour on the hour for five minutes, it spits out an arch of water that goes all the way across the Chicago River. The idea being, boats would be able to go underneath it and not get wet. That is not how gravity works. It took me a really long time to appreciate the irony of the fact that it celebrates an entity best known for reversing the flow of the Chicago River, which they did with a basic understanding of gravity and they have a in their honor designed by someone who has no understanding of gravity. Now I mentioned it's broken. One of the things the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District does today is they manipulate the level of the Chicago River to avoid flooding. In 2020, we had a torrential rainstorm and no amount of manipulation would have prevented the flooding. But the fountain got broken the flood. Also, they have a plaque where they misspelled Mississippi. <laughs> All right, coming into view here as we wait for some kayakers to get out of the way. We've got this building with the yellow ball. And that is the Hotel Intercontinental, completed in 1919. Walter Oschlager is the architect. And in architectural terms, that ball is called an onion mill. And it was originally a Medina Men's Club, and they're known for Arabic art. We don't get to see a lot of Arabic art here in Chicago, so if you want to check it out, there's a Starbucks in the lobby. Now, coming into view is a shorter building with blue green glass, silver steel, the University of Chicago's downtown campus. Now, the University of Chicago is a world-renowned university with its main campus in Hyde Park. The architect, to which Lohan, got a lot of criticism because there aren't any windows in the classrooms. To which Lohan responded, students should be paying attention during class, not looking out the window. He might have been on to something because they have over 90 Nobel Prize winners. And if you've ever met anyone who went to school there, they'll probably let you know that it's where fun goes to die. Now, you got on the boat at the base of the Wrigley Building. It's in that Beaux-Arts style, built in 1921. The architects are Graham, Anderson, Probst, and White. And it's got that decorative base, stack of floors, decorative top. It's got six different shades of glazed white terracotta. Starting off with the darkest terracotta at the bottom, working its way up to the lightest terracotta at the top which some people say was inspired by Steps of Chewing Gum, because it was home to a blue chewing gum company. They sold the building several years ago, and then it was purchased in the summer of 2018 by a local billionaire for $255 million. It must be nice. Now, it was originally a soap company, and then they including gum as a free gift they purchase. People were throwing away themselves. So. Now, from the International Hotel and Tower, it's the second tallest building in the city of Chicago, sixth tallest in the United States of America. It is 1,362 feet tall with the spire. The architects are Skidmore Owens and Merrill. The lead architect is Adrian Smith. He is also the lead architect of the tallest building in the world, 
Does anybody know what the tallest building in the world is? Burj Khalifa in Dubai, if you want a sense of how tall the tallest building in the world is, look up to the top of Trump and double that. Now, we asked Adrian Smith how he got involved in super talls. And his answer was he got a job at the architecture firm Skidmore Owings and Merrill when he was in college. And the very first building they assigned him to work on was the iconic John Hancock. Now we've got the black steel skyscraper, the American Medical Association building, completed in 1971. Its architecture is significant insofar as it's Lee Spandero's final building. He died in 69, this is completed in 71. Now, Lee Spandero is an internationally made architect who moved here from Germany to try to mention the Illinois Institute of Technology and brought with them what's known as the international style of architecture, which is defined by rejecting all non-essential ornamentation. Mises' philosophy was less is more. Now, because he moved into teach architecture, you're going to see a really strong Miesian influence on Chicago. A lot of international style buildings. Ironically, Bruce Van Goldberg, architect of the Women's City Towers, we call them the corner top buildings. Goldberg, the student of Andrews. He clearly rejected the international style. His philosophy was there are no right angles in nature, so there shouldn't be any right angles in architecture. A lot of people are very curious as to how these buildings are constructed. Think of a flower. The elevator is the stem, and each condo is a pie-shaped petal. And they really are pie-shaped. The narrowest part is where you enter the unit, the widest part is the balcony. One piece of pie is a studio, one and a half pieces of pie is a one bedroom, two pieces of pie is a two bedroom. Now this completed in 1967. In the 60s, people were moving from the city to the suburbs. So they had an idea for a city with a city. When the Atlanta City Towers first opened, it had a movie theater, bowling alley, grocery store, dry cleaner, marina, and a skating rink. They had to close the skating room a few years ago when someone accidentally skated over the edge. I'm kidding, that didn't really happen. There really was a skating rink, I just don't know why it closed. Then we've got this red brick masonry construction building, the Reed Murdoch Center, it's converted warehouse. George Nimmons is the original architect. Nimmons is known for his industrial work. Now, if you were doing this tour in the early 1900s, you'd be bored because all you'd be looking at is industrial buildings. This is one of the few remaining left on the river. If you look up, there's a clock tower. Lots of clock towers in Chicago. Anybody want to know why? Believe it or not, in the early 1900s, not everyone could afford an iPhone. And how else are we going to know what time it is? I can't afford one now. Like a thousand bucks. Now we've got this blue green glass building with the silver steel that is. 300 North was out, completed in 2009. The architects are Card and Schilfer. And it is LEED certified platinum. So LEED stands for Leadership and Energy and Environmental Design. Platinum is the highest designation you can get. Lots of different features that make this building worthy of a platinum designation. It is a rooftop garden to mitigate rainfall. And it uses river water for its cooling system. So it takes the river water in. It uses it to cool down the air conditioner and then spits it out at a greater to warmer. It's one of about a dozen buildings in the river that use river water for its cooling system. Then we have the merchandise bar in Chicago, completed in 1931. The architects are Graham, Anderson, Stokes, and Graham. It is Art Deco, defined by having a limestone facade, strong vertical lines of draw your eye up, setbacks, and geometric formulation. It is also the second largest building in the United States of America, with number one being the Pentagon. It's got eight miles of hallway. Now, it was originally built by Marshall Field to consolidate his warehouses. He had to sell it due to back taxes in 1945. Joseph E. Kennedy purchased it for $13 million. In 1998, the Kennedy family sold it 
for $575,000. So you call a really good return on your investment. I'm glad it worked out for them. They did not sell the piece of property next to the merchandise park. It was a parking lot. They didn't think it would ever be very valuable. So they were gonna throw it in on the deal in 98. Their facilities manager convinced them they should hold on to it. And as you can see, they're developing it. It's a development called Wolf Point. Now, Wolf Point's an important area in Chicago's history. One of our first homesteads was here. Early 1800s, 66 people lived at Wolf Point. They had a general store, a church, a post office, this whole area, and three taverns, which is about on point for Chicago's tavern to population ratio. And it was in one of those taverns where Chicago got its name. Trying to figure out what to call this area, they decided to call it their version of what the Native Americans called it. The Native Americans called this area Chicago, which means stinky onion. Now we're at what's called the junction. That's where all three branches of the Chicago River converge. That's the south branch. That's how we would take that to get to New Orleans. That's the north branch that would get us up to the suburbs. We're turning the boat around and going back to the back. Now, it also marks the beginning of the river walk. I'm going to tell you all about the river walk in just a moment. Oh, that was three glass building, 333 West Wacker, completed 1983. The architect of Cody Patterson and Fox. And it's in a style that we call textualism. That's when the building's footprint pays homage to the topography of the land. So we've got a curve in the river, we've got a 360 foot curving glass curtain walk. On the street side, it conforms to the grid. On a lighter note, it's where Ferris Bueller's dad went. It's also my favorite building on the river during the day. Now, as I mentioned, it marks the beginning of the river walk, which is completed in 2017. It allows you to walk all the way from 333 to Lake Michigan. People ask if there was a river walk before, and the answer is yes. However, it wasn't very welcoming. It had an extremely narrow sidewalk. What's worse than that, you couldn't walk underneath any of the bridges. So every time you came to a bridge, you could go up the stairs, cross the bridge, that's a lot of work. So, they added walkways and these silver things, they're called eyelashes, they keep you from getting hit in the head with debris. And then each bay, and that is what we call the areas between each of the bridges. Each bay has a theme and a name. And um, this one's called the Cove. It's got floating gardens with fauna native to the Chicago River. You can fish there. It is catch and release. We do not recommend you eat fish from the Chicago River. The good news is there's fish in the Chicago River. Over 30 different species. And in the bay, in the water, the romantic dinner, and the hotel, isn't very far away. Now, Mayor Daly commissioned the river walk about 15 years before it got complete. Because it had always been the vision of the leadership of the city of Chicago. That the river would be the centerpiece of the city. I lived here then. And while I don't speak for all Chicagoans, I can fairly safely tell you that we didn't really have a big interest in going to hang out with the Chicago. And in fact, you had told us back then that on rainy days there would be people hanging out on the Chicago River, we would have looked at you like you were nuts. But I work, rain or shine, and there's always at least one person walking along the Chicago River. And in fact, a couple weeks ago, someone must have gotten a little warm because they just had anything to swim. Their swim got interrupted by the police, but they tried. Now, you're going to go under this bridge, which is one of 38 masculine training bridges here in Chicago. 
which is the most of any city in the United States of America, and second in the world only to Amsterdam. We've got this building with the white base and the stack of floors is glass and steel. That is 77 West Labor, completed in 1990. Ricardo Bozo is the architect. And through the style, we call classical modernism. At the base, we've got arches, which is associated with classical and Roman architecture. And on the stack of floors, there's some modern elements with the glass and the steel. And then on the very, very top, there are pediments, which is associated with classical Greek architecture. Then we've got the building that looks like a hashtag, 55 West Wacker. And that, I know two things about this building. Number one, it's in an architectural style known as brutalism. Number two, I read an article about a tour guide in Chicago who specializes in ugly architecture. And he calls it the Danny DeVito of buildings. Sometimes people think Upper is going to be taking shots at Danny DeVito, but I'm sure he'll be okay. And I said what I said, and that opened a conversation about it. I did have someone come up to me get really mad at me because he told me Danny DeVito was an attractive man. Now, this gray building with the silver things in the window is the Leo Burnett building, which was in 1989. It's home to Leo Burnett Advertising Agency. Some of their campaigns include Coming the Tiger, Snap, Echo Pop, and Now Make Sun. Dick Lou and Roach are the architects, and it's a award winning. Now, we have coming into view this Beaux Arts style building called the Old Jewish Building. It's like that back in the days. Stack of floors, back in the top, and the very, very top is a dome. In architectural terms, that dome is called a Belvedere. And that was the home to the Stratosphere Lounge. Now, a lot of people are going to tell you the Stratosphere Lounge is where uh, Al Capone was. He was already in jail by the time of The Green Art Deco building with the gold spire on top, that is the Union. Carbide and carbon building between 1928, the architect of the Burnham Brothers, Daniel Burnham, the son. And it is said to be inspired by the New Year's Eve celebration when they opened the bottle of champagne. And that is the first class of building. I don't know if it's true or not, but it is true for the American flavor. And then this is our Vietnam Veterans Memorial along the wall with a plaque that was the name of all the fallen soldiers who were residents of Illinois. So last time we're talking about the Chicago flag, I'm guessing you've seen it all over town. In flag form, magnet form, tattoos, hats, shirts. We love our flag here in Chicago. Everything on the flag is symbolic. The two blue stripes represent our bodies of water, Lake Michigan and the Chicago River. The three white stripes represent the land masses divided by the Chicago River, north side, south side, and west side. And the four white stars represent important historic events. First star, Fort Newborn. Second star, Great Chicago Flag. Third star, World Columbia Exposition, the first one there. The fourth star is the Fairness, the second one there. You want to remember it's the four hats. Four, fire, air, fair. Additionally, each point on the star is symbolic, but I'm not very good at memorizing things. You're going to have to look that up in your mind. the fifth star we would add in Chicago, we chose those 2016 Summer Olympics. That bit with Rio de Janeiro. Some people feel we should add it with the top of the World Series, which we had a fifth F, finally. All right, we're getting ready to approach the dock. We're not going back to the dock that we came from, but just take the stairs out, turn right, and you'll end up back at the Brazil building. If you're an adult beverage, it's time to play the drinking game, chuck it or chuck it. On behalf of the cast and the crew, and the entire Mandela family, we really want to thank you. We love what we do. And if people like you, you know Mandela boat lines, we would get paid right boats. On a personal note, I've got the best job. And what makes it great is you guys. You guys have been great. You listen to me, you laugh at my jokes. I used to say to people like you and go on Mandela boat rides, that I would bore my friends and family with information about Chicago's history and architecture. And then I spent about 8 out of 12 months with my parents. We didn't really go anywhere. One could say I had a captive audience. Let's just say no one was drowning out the sound of my voice with laughter. You guys rock. Thank you.